Xbox said it. If you enjoy Final Fantasy 15, you'll enjoy Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, that's totally what I said. <laughs> Jim, you're an ass. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the differences between developer and player stories in open world games. Plus, Mirror Automata, Fury of Dracula, and a listener response to our Final Fantasy 15 roundtable. Backwardcompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 95 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today's media topic of discussion is going to be kind of like a part one of two, um, dealing a lot with open world games. As you know, there are a lot of uh, big open world games that have been coming out recently. No. <laughs> no. We've talked about Final Fantasy XV. And a few small ones. <laughs> uh, Zelda just came out. Horizon Zero Dawn came out. Um, and so we're going to be saving a lot of those discussions about those games specifically for our big roundtable that we're planning on. It's going to um, be a monster roundtable. I don't even think we're going to be able to all fit around the table because we're going to be doing multiple games at this round table with similar themes. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it's going to take us a while because unlike some people that talk about games, we want to play through the game as much as we can before we talk about it. Dare we call it apocalyptic? Yes. Actually, yes. Yeah. <laughs> they, they all deal with post-apocalyptic yes. games. Um, and so, return to and nature post, and post. lost technology. Beautiful apocalypse. Mm-hmm. I still like that as a genre. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But today we're speaking more broadly about um, storytelling in open world games, uh, using some of these games as examples, using other ones we've talked about before. Um, something it should be a good discussion. But first we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. A couple of episodes ago, we talked about playing Final Fantasy XV for our roundtable. Mm-hmm. That was a game that I was, um, I put a lot of hours into it. I believe I had in the somewhere in the 36 range, 32, 36 range before going to the show. Mm-hmm. But I didn't quite beat it. So after the show, I was able to go back and finish the game. Uh, finish the game. And I noticed, Chris, early on that you kind of slipped in Final Fantasy XV as a open world game. Mm-hmm. Which I would not consider it such, but that was... I sort of see where you're going with that, but I would say it's probably not, just because it's very, very controlled in terms of where you can go and mm-hmm. win. Um, there's certainly areas that are completely locked off, you know, real hard, literal gates throughout mm-hmm. the game. Um, and then, of course, the chapter structure themselves is very linear, mm-hmm. even just having chapters. But Well, I'm sure as we'll get into uh, later on mm-hmm. during our discussion, uh, there's the concept of gating, where mm-hmm. um, a lot of games will actually sort of gate off certain areas until later. But yep. Narratively or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, so, speaking of the ending of the game, when I went through, I, I did. I was actually surprised when I went back and started playing after the, the show just how close I was to the end. Because mm-hmm. I think I was on around chapter 8 or 9, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that there was about 14 chapters in the game. Uh, and the 15th is like the one at the end where you've already beaten it. So I knew that, I thought, okay, well, I still have a ways to go. But actually, those chapters go by very quickly. They do. Um, the game kind of shifts gears into a completely linear format. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you definitely can't call it open world. Oh, it's sure. completely just, I agree. you must now go down this path. I sort of get what they were doing. They are trying to finish the story. Um, I, I did enjoy the way that, you know, sort of the way that the story progressed because there were some pretty interesting um Developments, uh, the the blinding of oh geez I'm blanking on his name Ignis Ignis yeah mm-hmm. uh, it, the blinding of Ignis which y'all had mentioned was going to happen and it happened shortly thereafter mm-hmm. um, the whole battle with the Leviathan was was pretty cool it happened just after that um, but in terms of just the, re- the what happens in the rest of the game I felt like the game encourages you to run away which I found odd hmm. um, in the la- when you return from and this is, this is a really big beef I have with the final part of the game. So basically, at one point, um, Noctis is essentially, he goes and he meets with Bahamut, and they have this conversation, and now he's, he's got to be prepared to, you know, finally face, um, what's it, Aaron, I think his name is? Um, 
Arden. Arden. Thank yes. You. I knew. Close. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to face Arden, and so he's got to, he kind of like has this, I'm going to, I don't even know, like, we go into some sort of a stasis sleep for a hundred years. It wasn't a hundred years. It was like twenty years or something. I don't know. I think it was ten, 10 years. years yeah. Whatever. He's out. He's out for a while. He has. He grows a pretty cool beard. He comes out looking great. Um, <laughs> but he comes out real rugged. But I thought when he comes out, I'm thinking, okay, he's he's out. He's going to be this super badass. I'm ready to go. And the first thing that happens when you when you go out is that the world is covered in demons, mm-hmm. and they all. Some of them outlevel you by quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Like you could, and the path that you have to take to even get to the town again, not open. You have, you have to take this path in order mm-hmm. to get through it. Um, they have these these giant demons that are about that outlevel you by like forty levels. Mm-hmm. Like I was around the forties, and this eighty level demon or something that just, and I'm just by myself too. Mm-hmm. I have to run away. It completely subverts this idea of Noctis is here, mm-hmm. and he's going to defeat all the demons and restore the world to peace, and it's going to be great. He's the savior. He's a sissy. No, he, the demons are, are, are the demons are much more difficult than Arden, by the way. Mm-hmm. Like, why don't why doesn't he just send them after Noctis' crew? <laughs> because I'd be killed. Yeah. Um, same thing when you actually go into the final battle. I liked there was a lot of, of very dramatic scenes, and melodrama as well. I will I will say, mm-hmm. but I still enjoyed it. Uh, admittedly, I, I am. Um, do you still watch some anime? And I'm I'm a fan of the way that sometimes Japanese uh, story talk can be a little over the top. Mm-hmm. Um, so that worked for me, to be honest with you. But I just didn't like that contrast of here's a boss fight. It's being presented as this super um, epic encounter. You know, for example, with um, Ifrit, mm-hmm. um, the the giant fire dude. Um, that was really cool. But right before Ifrit, they they treat him like, oh, it's just going to be this big boss battle. Right before that, there are these giant demon things that are, again much higher level than you, mm-hmm. to the point where unless you've done a lot of leveling of your characters, you have to run away. Mm-hmm. You cannot win. Which, I like the idea of optional bosses. Like, those have been in Final Fantasy before, and that's basically what these are. Mm-hmm. But they were never right on the path to the main boss. They are a, I'm going to go over this way and do this optional boss, and then I'm going to return. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, from a story perspective, you've just walked into death. Like, mm-hmm. what's what's the point? Why is he even bothering with E3? Why not just send, after, send these demons after him? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think... The game still ended pretty well, but it was very on rails and structured and didn't quite... I think they could have been a lot better, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I overall enjoyed the experience, but I really think that they they missed an opportunity to end on a high note. Mm-hmm. I think that, um, and we sort of t- touched on this briefly um, during the roundtable, but I think that part of that is kind of this idea that just on your own, you're not going to be able to overcome all this stuff. Um, I think it's kind of it's trying to show you just how bad everything is and how you kind of need to get to this place to use the specific power to call upon the specific power that you don't have in order to end everything. Um, so making the player feel like you know well, why did I have to do this thing when I could have just gone and slayed all the demons myself? Um, I think that might have been part of why they did what they did there. But um, I don't know it, it's kind of a question of like you know narrative choices versus gameplay choices. Um, that I personally I, I enjoyed, and I, I don't mind the structure of kind of like I'm almost thinking of it now. We've talked before about um, you know stories that branch, stories that kind of are the uh, the braided cord. Um, this one kind of strikes me as the story that is uh, linear, and then there's this giant bulb uh, in the kind of like early middle part, and then it goes linear again, for like a of colon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> the ending was cool. Mm-hmm. I liked the final battle, it was, but it was it was cool in A, and this is maybe something that we can talk about later today as well, um, the tendency for some games to have a very structured encounter mm-hmm. because they want it to look cool, yeah. and they don't trust the player to have it look cool. I so they that, take control, a lot of, and yeah. it becomes the sort of quick-time event thing, which I, I really don't like that trend in modern games. Mm-hmm. I agree with you on that. And that's something that we can talk about because when it comes to open world, they can get into that trap, too, if they're not careful, where, oh, it's an open world, uh, but the gameplay is not as open as it could be, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so it kind of just, it's, it, it doesn't trust the player enough. And maybe that's something we can add to our list, trust. Mm-hmm. Who are you going to trust? <laughs> I trust you, Jim. Okay. I'm going to trust the $60 they paid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trust um, the money. That, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, that's actually the answer most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to go ahead and mention quick, uh, quickly one that we might do a roundtable on at some point, um, Near Automata. I've not quite cleared the prologue chapter yet. Um, the game is structured rather interestingly. It uh, doesn't have autosaves, which is a very modern convention that's almost standard now. Um, you have to save manually, and unless there's a way to save through just the start menu that I'm not aware of yet, 
um, it seems like you actually have to get to a particular point and then like save at you know a specific save spot in order to. So, what, from what I hear, because there were actually people, and I, that's why I was going to ask you, mm-hmm. but you said you hadn't gotten past the prologue. Um, there were some people complaining in, in the Steam forums or Steam chat about the game that they couldn't save. They're like, "Well, it's telling me that I can save, but I can't get saved in the prologue, and I mm-hmm. keep dying and having to start over." Mm-hmm. And apparently, this is an intentional choice by the game by mm-hmm. the, the game creator. Um, Yoko, Yoko Taro, I believe, is, is the name. Uh, it's an actual intentional choice mm-hmm. where you can save. You do have the ability to just save anywhere, but you have to get through the prologue before you have that ability. And it's actually tied into part of the way that the game works and the story. It actually makes sense after mm-hmm. you get to the prologue. Interesting. So, I, which I, I stopped reading there, like mm-hmm. from people that were responding to those, ex- trying to explain that because I didn't want to know that reason. Mm-hmm. I wanted to experience it myself. Gotcha, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to play it too. Mm-hmm. And there's just so many games coming out that have come out in a recent period that I. I'd love to play. It, That's it, one of them. Is it? Is it? I mean, how are you enjoying it from a gameplay perspective? It's it's interesting. It kind of strikes me as somewhat old school. It has kind of an arcadey feel hmm. here and there. Um, there are parts that are just like straight up top down or side scrolling bullet hells. Oh wow! Um, you you also have these portions where it's kind of classic platinum style, um, you know, three D brawler. Style yeah, I hear it because there was an, an earlier game, mm-hmm. near game that was out that was apparently didn't have very good com a very good combat system at all. Mm. And when they when platinum decided to publish it, they ended up using the same battle, the same combat system, and some of the same designers too that worked on Bayonetta. Mm-hmm. So it has that sort of infused into it. Yeah. And I hear the combat system is actually really good for that reason. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because you have this little comp- companion character that um, like sort of floats over your shoulder and you can use it to just shoot this very rapid stream of bullets um, just like this Gatling gun style just constantly mm-hmm. um, you can use it you can lock onto enemies or you can aim it manually so you can have this thing just streaming bullets and stuff as you're fighting with your melee weapons um, and what's kind of funny is you find yourself especially if you want to be able to evade kind of doing the whole deal where um, you've got your index finger and your middle finger on the shoulder buttons uh, while you're also using your thumbs on the pad and the um, or the, the joystick and the face buttons. So um, it, there's definitely like a lot going on. It's very sort of high-octane action, which is really cool. Um, like I said, it's got those sort of top-down um, elements. And the thing with the prologue, having to start over if you die, um, definitely feels old school. Like, you know, you go to the arcade, if you get a game over, you have to start over from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um I actually cleared it on my first try, but then because I was downloading the game, it does the thing the PS4 does where it lets you play sort of like an opening section or like a kind of an isolated portion of the gameplay while Mm -hmm. it's installing the rest. And so I got to the end of the prologue, and it's like, okay, cool, we're downloading the rest. Um, But like if you want to go back to the menu, you're going to lose any progress. It's like, oh, well, you know, I know it doesn't autosave, but I imagine that it would save at this point. So I quit, and while it was downloading, I switched to another game, came back and found that I had to start over. So I'm like, okay. And so this time I knew what I was doing, and I was very confident, and I got a little bit too overconfident on the final boss for the prologue um, and died, and then realized that I've gone to have to start over again. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this another night. <laughs> but enough, um, but no, I am looking forward to getting back into it cool. and um, hopefully have more to say about it next time. Cool. Yeah, I'm hoping to pick it up after, after I played Zelda. Mm-hmm. That's my life now. <laughs> now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. All right, so I had a chance to play a new but not new board game. It was new to me. It's called Fury of Dracula. This is actually a... Dracula. I know. <laughs> uh, it's actually a really uh, pretty old game in, in, you know, in board game terms. Anything that's like 10 years old is, 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 is old. Um, but this is the third edition of hmm. Fury of Dracula, and it's actually pretty new. It's by Fantasy Flight Games, which in my personal opinion is one of the greatest... Um, board game makers, mm-hmm. uh, if not the greatest board game makers out there. Um, they're just fantastic. And so they took Fury of Dracula and they sort of rebooted it and put a nice uh, shiny new map and, and art and great cards and all of this stuff. And and it reads a bit like a sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Hmm. So you've got all those characters you would expect in there. You've got Lucy. Uh, you've got her fiancé, Lord Godalming. You've got um, Van Helsing. All those guys are there. Now, now, can we confirm that when you say sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh-huh. do you mean the 1990s film with starring Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder? <laughs> 
Uh, no, Jim. Okay. <laughs> I'm referring to the knockoff book that okay. was published Wait, by Bram Stoker a book? as a result of that wonderful film. The, the book adaptation. The of book the adaptation oh, okay. of yes. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, um, the Just one wanted to clear that up. Yeah, so. the one that uh, the one that I read in high school. <laughs> How about that? Um, no, and and. So think of this as a board game version of a book that doesn't exist, okay? Um, in that sense, what you're doing is you're telling the story as it goes. Um, so Dracula somehow has either survived or didn't die or whatever, and now he's loose in Europe. Mm. And so his goal is to get enough influence to um, bring about the, oh, let's just call it the vampire apocalypse, Um and your goal as this team of Dracula hunters, vampire hunters, is to go around Europe and track down where he is. So it's kind of like Carmen San Diego, except with Dracula? Yeah, a little bit. Where in the world is Dracula San Diego? That's correct. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but the thing about it is, uh, through this and that negotiation of various contracts, hmm. what we're really talking about here um, is a... Uh, property, call it, call it a property, uh, that the license is probably not going to be renewed on without getting into the details. So this great game, which is about 80 bucks on Amazon right now, um, pretty soon is going to go away. And so the reason I wanted to mention it is grab a copy now while you still can. Because uh, what's amazing about this is it's, it's a cooperative game mechanic that you just don't see much of. I mean, there's there's another game out there where you hunt Jack the Ripper and, and you kind of do that collectively. Same, same group, same team. But this type of game where one player is playing as the, um, the monster that you're hunting down and the rest of the team is working together to hunt them down is, um, I think, truly innovative. It, it, it causes, to, to, to quote the owner of the game, um, it, it causes a, an itch that is hard to scratch, hmm. and this scratches that itch, hmm. if you know what I mean. Um, what's neat about this one is there is actually a fight mechanic involved in it. So it's not just about finding Dracula. Once you get there, he might bite you, he might kill you. Um, there's actually, you've got to come loaded to bear, if you will. Uh, you really want to try to get there at the same time, gang up on him. Uh, he might drop uh, other, well, I, I should say make. He might make other vampires that are going to come after you, that kind of a thing. We had this really great moment. As it happens, we played last night. Um, and, and, and we had this wonderful, wonderful moment where at the very end of it, it was about to tick over uh, to where he had enough influence just by the mechanics, sort of the built-in timer in the game, and I love games that do that, where he was going to win. Mm. Um, and we had pretty much no chance because we needed to get six hits, six points of damage on Dracula, and all we had was a knife. <laughs> and so uh, Lord Godalming uh, stabs him with his knife and actually gets the three points of damage, but then Dracula bites him or slashes at him with his claws, does his thing, mm -hmm. and uh, we think, oh, we're dead because he's gonna, he took more damage than he had. Uh, Lord, Godal Lord Godalming's going down, and then Lucy's Revenge gets played hmm. by the pulled out from Lord Godalming, which we'd done a series of trades to make sure he got that because he's the only one who can have it. And, and if you know your Dracula lore, uh, Lucy was, as I said, the fiance who died. She was turned into a vampire. They, spoiler alert for, hmm. for, for, for a hundred year old book. Yeah. Uh, they had to, they had to stake her and cut her head off, right? Hmm. So he's, he's out for revenge. So he's able to avoid the last point of killing damage once and gets one more turn. So it's literally down to the last card on the last turn for the last point of damage for Lucy's revenge on Lord Godalming and he pulls out his knife and stabs Dracula one more time and Dracula doesn't defend against it and he goes down. Nice. So we killed him at the very last one. I mean, we were dancing around the room. It was amazing. <laughs> um, so, um, Fury of Dracula is the name of the game. Get it while you still can. And if you like this idea of a co-op game, uh, check out some of the other co-op games that Fantasy Flight has because, um, frankly, they're, they're amazing. Um, we like the Jack the Ripper one, too. So here you go. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, Email inbox at backward-compatible.com. All right, guys. It's time for another inbox. Uh, we have loyal listeners, 
And uh, as you know, statistically, mm -hmm. uh, Every email that we actually receive represents approximately 1,000 people who thought about writing but did not. Mm -hmm. And Is it 1,000 or 10,000? Oh, I don't it, know it might be 10,000. Yeah, I think you might um, have misplaced a decimal It's possible, mm -hmm. but you know what? 47.3% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Mm -hmm. So that is important to consider. Um, Nathan writes... In episode 93, Doc remarked how his unusual play style may have harmed his enjoyment of the game. Now, to, to bring us back, 93 is the one where we talked about Final Fantasy XV. Right. Um, extrapolating from there and applying that play style to the other JRPGs, I think that JRPGs may just not work for explorer player types. This, I think, in part, is due to the heavier emphasis on developer narrative rather than a player-driven one. Rather than allowing the players to tackle things at their own pace, JRPGs oftentimes lock features, explorable areas, and secrets behind narrative progress. Uh, that is, character progress as well, but that tends to go hand-in-hand in hand with narrative advancement. And this hamstrings players like Doc who want to unlock all the map and complete it and overlevel his character before he does story stuff, end quote, <laughs> and forces them to experience the game in the way the developer wants them to rather than the way they, the player, do. <laughs> then he asks, do you agree or disagree? I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Regards, Nathan. So what do you think, guys? Well, some good thoughts there, Nathan, actually. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting thing because for me, not being an explorer player type, I think Final Fantasy XV kind of appealed to an element of like that that part of me that's an explorer type, but not being a true explorer type, I was kind of contented with what like little leeway it gave me. Explorer poser, got it. I, yeah. I think part of that too with the because <laughs> he talks about JRPGs, and I, I would say I would argue that that's more of a convention of more modern JRPGs mm. and certain JRPGs as opposed to just any. RPG that happens to be Japanese. You think is, so? Yes. Well, because Dark Souls is a JRPG. Well, do you mean that just in, in terms no, no, no. of I'm, the narrative, I, or do you I want to make sure that we, we we touch on this? Dark Souls is a JRPG. I wouldn't know. I I never got past the first room where I was supposed to kill a thing. Right, but but that is an, that is a very much an explorer game. That is okay. very much an explorer game. It's a very open game. I've heard you this. can go all over the place. Right. It completely subverts what he's what he's talking about because I think when we say JRPG, what we're really talking about is certain AAA titles that are Japanese RPGs that are inspired by anime. Mm. That's basically what we... What we, what we when we, most people say JRPG, that's what they mean. Yeah, yeah. But that's not actually what JRPG means. Mm -hmm. JRPG is, is a Japanese role-playing game. Mm -hmm. You can make very strong arguments, and I know some people don't like to say it, mm -hmm. but The Legend of Zelda is could be considered oh, yeah, no, a Japanese it's, RPG. It's actually been classified it's certainly by the Japanese RPG, yeah. And it skirts the line between RPG, you know, maybe it, is it an action RPG or mm -hmm. is it just an action adventure. Mm -hmm. So, arguably it's another J J uh, JRPG mm -hmm. then I would also say a lot of the older um, JRPGs things like the original Final Fan uh, the original Final Fantasy to use a big series that is typically guilty of what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. Um if you do if you look at some of the earlier ones even though there was um, a, a, a sense of narrative gating, you actually could do a lot of exploration early on. Um, and you, and once, you get, once you get your ship, it opens up, sort of unlocks a large portion of the world, almost, almost the entire world. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a little bit more that you can't actually get to unless you have the airship. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to get to these places, you might have to, your, your character is going to be underleveled, you might have to grind some. But you can do a lot of exploration. It's, it's less like, say... Um, Final Fantasy X or Final Fantasy VIII or something like that, where these games are very um, linear. And then when it comes to Final Fantasy XV, which you mentioned, Chris, mm -hmm. it it has that element of it. It it does have that openness to a degree, mm -hmm. but it also falls into a lot of those same traps, which I yep. think is why Doc didn't quite didn't quite latch onto it as well. As well, well you're not going to insult me by saying that a game I didn't like is like a genre I don't like. So right. <laughs> right. Yeah, for the for the sake of discussion, though, let's assume that what he does mean is the more kind of like what people tend to think of as JRPG, mm -hmm. and not just things that are strictly RPGs that also happen to be Japanese. And how, how would you think Persona fits into this? Given that Persona Five is going to be releasing, I believe next month, about mm -hmm. this time next month, so mm -hmm. it is topical. I, I'd call it a JRPG. Oh um, no, no, it is. Yeah. But, I, but I mean the series itself. Mm -hmm. 
does it do you think that it that this particular criticism if it could be considered a criticism mm-hmm. i don't think it's a criticism so much as more just of an observation an right? observation yeah. but do you think it would apply to the persona series as someone who has played them or at least one or two of them i'd say so um i think though that a thing that persona does that's interesting is despite it's being linear, mm-hmm. strictly speaking, as far as the gameplay is concerned, they explain that with um, you know passage of linear time. You know, you're you're literally right. going day to day, week to right. week, um, and also that you know at least in Persona Four, which is the one I have the most experience with, um, the particular dungeon you're going into is to save the person who most recently went dis- or w- most recently disappeared. Mm-hmm. Um, you have no reason to leave your hometown. Um, and technically you can for just like miscellaneous little things like you can go to like a nearby city to go shopping or something like that Um, but for the most part the dungeons exist in a world separate from your own so you've got your day to day life and you have the other world and there's a specific world you're wanting to go into to accomplish your mission and that other world when you go into it the presentation at least and how how you advance through that that other world is almost like almost a roguelike Mm -hmm. type structure like it's very much a deep dungeon crawl kind Mm -hmm. of kind of structure Mm -hmm. um so it's almost like a game mashup is what persona sort of is that's Mm -hmm. why it's why i brought it up yeah i think i think it can sort of apply to what he's saying but it is a very different sort of game and and certainly anime inspired Mm -hmm. um i do think that there is that emphasis on um linear storytelling because the developer does have a story they want to tell right but i think that there's still a balance there Mm -hmm. and i think that there is like for example um I know, I know we talk a lot about you know, the player types, and you all have talked about it before. I'm not completely sold on the concept, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Um, maybe it's just because I don't actually think I fit into any of them, because mm-hmm. I feel like I pick, can pick up a game and get into the groove and become a, adopt a different play style sure. just for that game and yeah. then change up. So I, I, I feel mm-hmm. like it's more of a, um, an approach that people might take to, to games, mm-hmm. but I don't think that you have to take that approach in every game. Oh, I agree. That makes uh, sense. Doc, yeah. Doc certainly doesn't, didn't have to play Final Fantasy XV that way, and it might have impacted the way that he played, but maybe maybe he should have adopted a different play style to try to, you know, to, try to get into the groove of that yes. game and, and see, see if you like doing it that and way. And I admit that and in maybe episode you, 93. Right, mm-hmm. precisely. And so, you know, but, but um, it is a good point that it is, it is the sort of game that might be difficult um, for those that choose to adopt the, the Explorer mindset. Mm-hmm. You're, it's not going to work for that game. Yeah. You're not really going to be able to do it. Or at least if you do, you're not going to be satisfied. Mm-hmm. And I think for the, that player type thing, it's a lot like those sort of personality tests where really you're somewhere, most people are somewhere in the middle of each given spectrum. But you can sort of like take your tendencies and say like, okay, I'm going to tend to like this, I'm going to tend to behave this way, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, and kind of make some more broad... Like, you know, I think for Doc especially, you know, he always says he's an explorer, and I think for his particular play style, um, it, it makes sense for him to say that because he really does prefer that strongly. Whereas for me, I think I'm more like you, Jim, where, like, I don't really... I, if I am a certain type, it's, like, not that much further ahead of any of the other types, that sort of thing. I've taken those tests before, and, I, and I actually on different days. Mm-hmm. One, I tend to actually be... be Fairly even in most of the mm. areas. And are we talking uh, gamer the, type or are we yeah. talking personality type? Bar, the gamer type. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so one, I tend to be actually a mix of a lot of them. And mm-hmm. then also I'll, I'll take it on different days depending on what game I'm playing. Mm-hmm. I've taken it again and, and based on the game that I'm playing, I'll, I'll have tendencies towards the way that I played that game. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I actually think yeah. like, that's just... So that makes sense. You know what? That's probably a really great skill to have. Yeah, um, but I think you know we. Which is not to say there aren't some games that I just don't like. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's part of it too. There's certainly game types that I just I play and I just doesn't doesn't grab me. Mm-hmm. On that on that same episode, Minecraft is a great example. Nathan was writing about, uh, you know, uh, Eric Brody was was our guest, mm-hmm. and and he was talking about how for. Uh, for him, he'll sit down either with a mentality of today's a story day mm-hmm. or today is, is not a story day. And I think that plays in really well to what we're going to talk about for a meaty topic today. Right? Oh, I think so, too. But, it's all um, related. You know, uh, it's, it's, I do that sometimes, too. Mm-hmm. And, and I think I said that on that day. Um, but sometimes I'll sit down with a whole game with mm-hmm. that mentality of, of I'm going to play this game for the story or I'm going to play this game um, you know, to, as, an, as an explorer, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, a great example of that is um, the Mad Max game, which I, I literally watched the entire series of um, Grimm mm. while playing that game. Mm-hmm. 
which doesn't say much for Grimm, <laughs> uh, that I could follow the entire thing. Um, but, you know, I sometimes call these dishwashing shows. Um, the Expanse is not a dishwashing show. You cannot watch the show while doing the dishes. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Some shows you can turn on, on the iPad or whatever, or the small TV, and just be like, okay, it's, I'm, wa- I'm washing the dishes and I'm doing this, and it's fine. Mm-hmm. And then I think there's some games that are going to be the same way, where you can't have a second screen with some games. Mm-hmm. And so... I think in some ways that's kind of what we're talking about here is JRPGs, um, to me, too often fall into that category of being the second screen game. And then they expect you during these moments mm. to turn off your second screen and pay really close attention to what's going on in the JRPG because we're back to that really important story stuff. Mm-hmm. And by, frankly, if that was three or four hours ago or 15 hours ago, I've forgotten what Noctis's mission was, and I don't care. That's really what it comes down to me. So you got to keep me engaged with that story quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, as a, as a preview of, of a little bit of what we're going to mm-hmm. say before, I think Horizon Zero Dawn has fallen into that trap a mm-hmm. little bit for me. Interesting. And um, I actually have some complaints about mm-hmm. the the story with Horizon, even though it's brilliantly written for mm-hmm. that reason alone. For four four fifteen, do you think that? There's there's a way that they could have, and I do think a lot of uh, open world games are like this, where they could have done a better job marrying that open world content with the story that they were trying to tell. Always, I think the answer so, is always. If you have to ha- have to ask the question, I think the answer is yes, always. Mm-hmm. And one of the easiest ways to do it is to strip out extra content. Yeah, that's you get into. I mean, I, I know I think that you're right. I, I I'll, I'll agree with you when you say that's the easiest way, but is that the right way? Not necessarily. Um, Don't take the easy way out. <laughs> the easy way. Well, I think I think that there needs to be, um, and and this kind of gets back to another thing that, that that Chris and I were talking about. If that game had been almost more linear, mm. in the sense that you could, there was no no turning back. Once you got through one of the gates, you kept going. In other words, if you can picture the map of Final Fantasy XV mm-hmm. as being uh, a really long line, yeah. Instead of being this big rectangle, a road trip instead of literally like, hey, a road I'm going trip, back and forth more like and Route exploring. 66 yeah. or West Coast to East Coast. If they had done that, and then you had the changing of biomes, mm-hmm. you have all of that stuff, and it makes sense. I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, yeah. um, you can still go off the path, but you can't go back. Yeah. So it's I'm like going to hold on to some of those ideas because um, next week we're going to be talking about scale, which I think is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, how do you know how big should video game worlds be? Another sin that Horizon Zero Dawn commits. Ugh. But um, yeah, this it's, this is a this is a good this is a good episode. Next week is too. I'm I'm excited. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. We talked about storytelling in open world games and and actually how you tell a story in an open world game. And maybe there's not a right answer here. But I want to talk about it because there are a lot of different ways that you can approach storytelling, and um, and specifically specifically in an open world game. And I think, well, I mean, kind of the first thing I kind of want to talk about is, and, and we've mentioned this before, the the concept of the developer story versus the player story, and then how that fits into the concept of having an open game. Um, and for those who who may not know, and, and since um, you're the uh, professor here, Doc, if you want to kind of go over. What is developer story? Just and what is player story? How do these? What are these concepts? I have these terms? no idea. No. <laughs> um, okay, so the general definition of this is that if you have a game you're making, mm. and you know Tim Schafer says make the game you're making. <laughs> um, if you have a game you're making, you probably have a story you're telling. Probably sure. Uh, unless sure. it's just something like well Tetris, it's going to have a plot. Even Mario had a plot, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what you've got then is a decision immediately, as soon as you have a story hook or an idea, and that's how much of that story is going to be what I, the developer, am giving to the player to discover, and how much of that is going to be what the player creates out of their actions. Mm-hmm. And, and that can take different ways. I mean, right. it can be as um, obvious as branching story, which means you have to write three-dimensionally, mm-hmm. four-dimensionally, really. Um, or it can be something as uh, completely emergent as Firewatch, where your decisions really don't matter, but they add flavor. Um, mm-hmm. So that's pretty much it. And, and part of it with, with open-world games, uh, when it comes to player story in open-world games, mm-hmm. a lot of what we're talking about is 
Um, the developers give you this huge environment. They come up with rules for that environment. For example, the way that the way that um, the creatures in that environment in that space interact with one another and would interact with you. Those that's part of the rules of that world. Mm -hmm. Then they also give you tools that allow you to interact with that world. That's for right. example, in the Legend of Zelda: uh, Breath of the Wild, the new one. Um, some of those tools are your runes. You can use the magnesis rune to pick up and move around metal objects. You can use the stasis rune to freeze objects and then launch them through the air when you attack them. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. basically feed them kinetic energy, and then when the stasis runs out, they launch. Now, these are the different apps you pick up for your cell phone that, that Link has, right? Yes, the, okay. the, the, the Sheikah Slate, which is basically a cell phone. And they actually... They're they're quite aware of what they're doing. In fact, if you do the once you get the camera app for it, mm -hmm. um, and you turn it on, you could, there's a there's a flip around for like a selfie mode, yep. and so Link will pose. <laughs> really? So you can take a picture, but then if you click the selfie mode, it'll turn around, and now there's Link, and he like poses. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he does. why does there not exist an actual app for your actual phone, which connects and allows you to have a second screen that is the map or something, so that you can have your Sheikah Slate in your hand as you're playing? Um, why? Why? Why, Jim? Well, I think there's a good answer for that. There's a couple of reasons. One, the game does give you a map if you choose to be a casual and not play in pro mode. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Challenge accepted. Uh, the, the reason I mention that, though, honestly, is is they do actually have a map on the screen when you're when you're playing in normal mode, mm -hmm. um, and it gives you other information too, like the noise that you're making for stealth and the temperature and all that. But the game is focused so much on exploration. That's, mm -hmm, a, that's mm -hmm. a driving force of this game. Is to, They're telling you, go out and explore. They don't want you to use the map. They want you to, because literally you go up to people, and this is one of the things that I think they do very well when it comes to, to player story. Um, you'll find someone to give you a quest. And this game really it just directly gives you quests. And you have a quest, an adventure log, they call it, mm -hmm. um, that keeps track of these quests, and, you know, side quests as well, and, and shrine quests. And you'll run up to somebody and he'll say, oh, there's this interesting thing that I saw over there. It's over here by this, and they'll, they'll name off a landmark. And they'll say, it's in that direction, and they'll point. And the map is not going to tell you where to go. You look at your map, if you, if you try to, 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 to sort, look for that quest, most of the time, you'll, the, the marker that it puts on your map will be where the person that gave you the quest yeah, is. The it's not where your quest is supposed to go. Fascinating. So you're supposed to go, okay, how am I going to get to that location? There's not, a, there's not a road that's going to take you there. You don't know exactly where it is, but you have a general idea. And then you have, it's up to you to explore, and the way that you get there becomes your story. Your player story. Yes, your player story. Right. And let, me, let me talk a little Emerging bit about properties. some of these. Yes. And so um, have you all played – Chris, I know you've played some of Zelda. Mm -hmm. um, have you played the uh, – just, just to mention this, because um, I, I told us all to track our hours played in games before mm -hmm. we came in. I don't know how much you all did that. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been playing nothing but Breath of the Wild just because I'm really into the game, and it's the one that I have for the new releases. Um, I'm at about 79 hours, or mm -hmm. sorry, 69 hours, um, which for me is a lot of hours because mm -hmm. of the m amount of time that I work. So that means that practically all of my free time has been Legend of Zelda when I'm not out of the house doing this, like recording a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, what about you? I know you, I know you have both Zelda and um, Horizon. Horizon. Yeah. Um, I think I've put in it, my... I couldn't find an exact number, but the switch seems to suggest that I'm at um, 25 plus. Mm. Um, so I don't know what that means exactly uh, for Zelda. For Horizon, I'm probably under 10. Mm. Um, and how many have you taken down? Any divine beasts yet? I've taken down one divine beast. Okay, I've yep. taken down four mm -hmm. to to put it into context. And Doc, that sounds awful. Divine beasts, man. <laughs> well, I've only played about an hour, right? Um, because I actually played on on Chris's system. Yeah, and I was don't curious more about yet. Horizon. But Horizon, I've played a good sixty hours. Nice. I'm, I'm level thirty seven nice. or so. And you were just about finished with that game? No, 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 no. I I have done barely half of the content. By by design, like you intentionally want to. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, and, and you know me. I'm, no, no. I, 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 I expected it, but I didn't. I, I overlevel and then I and then I go in and do the main story missions. <laughs> right. Um, but you know what? It, it's interesting because um, I'll switch gears just a little yeah, bit and talk about Horizon. Um, I actually encourage people who are playing Horizon to not shy away from the story missions. Quite quite a few of the really good story missions that are about level fifteen or sixteen is what they're marked at. When you hit that level. Don't shy away from them. Go ahead and do those missions. They're on a part of the map that's kind of way out there, and you've got to kind of explore your way out there and do it. Go ahead and blaze a trail. Get out there. Do it. Um, I'm level, Like I said, I'm level 37-ish. I haven't even uh, unlocked all the tall necks yet. I've still got Fog of War 
on mm. my on my screen. But what I'm doing now is a couple of the main missions to get myself caught up, if you will, with where I am, so that they're not. Um, it's not that they're too easy. I think that that the difficulty level is still there for me. I, I'm, I'm still uh, feel like the the machines could could kill me and could take me down. Um, it's that I don't want to get too out in front of it this time. So I'm not making the mistake I made on on Final Fantasy 15 this time. <laughs> having detected and noted kind of a similar design. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. No, I, I heard it here first. These are these are very similar games. Doc said it. If you enjoy Final Fantasy 15, you'll enjoy Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, that's Zero totally Dawn. what I said. <laughs> Jim, you're an ass. Well, we're going to cut out some of that. We're going to splice it in so it sounds like that's what you said. Okay, yeah, but don't splice out Jim, you're an ass. <laughs> oh, no, no, never. Um, <laughs> That'll be in the opener. You know, there, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that really surprised me at the game that I thought were wonderful. Tracking, for example, I did not expect tracking to be in there. Uh, your focus is something that that helps you with your heads up. It's it's augmented right. reality basically. Um, but there's quite a few missions, side missions and whatnot, where it's like, um, yeah, somebody stole my stuff, man. I don't know. You've got that second sense, that second sight. Will you go track them down for me? And you're like, yeah, sure. You pull up your your special augmented reality focus, and you're like, oh, I see some tracks, and you follow the tracks. That's so cool. I didn't even know that was in the game. That wasn't even advertised. Mm. And that kind of thing really compels me because it, it just draws me in with the, the whole exploring, mm-hmm. to being taken to a new place. Oh. The problem is, yes. there because of the way they wrote some of the story stuff, you get to an area and you're like, there's nothing here. Oh, this is a future story zone. And it's empty. Because you're not ready for the story part of it yet. It hasn't been populated yet. Oh, that is a huge flaw. It is. Oh, wow. No, I totally get... Oh, that is not That's a problem. And and so not only that, but even like side missions, little missions, um, I accidentally stumbled into a bandit camp. Uh And I was like, cool, I'll kill all these guys. Right. Killed them all. And then um, she made this really weird comment, and then I used my focus, and I saw two two people like um, on their knees, and they were down there, you know, underneath. I'm like, cool, I'm going to rescue them, which is a thing you do Mm -hmm. in the bandit camps. Couldn't get in there because the door was locked. Looked around, looked for the key, did everything I could, and so like, what is going on here? And then I realized I had a mission to do this, but I hadn't triggered the first half of the mission oh. and followed the tracks oh. mm. up. And so I had classic to, mistake. Uh, yeah, so I went classic south by like a yeah. hundred meters. Went as she went ah. Here are the tracks to the wagon, and then I followed the tracks to the wagon. Went back up there, and guess what? All the bandits were back. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm just like, oh, I gotta kill him again, and which I did, which wasn't a big deal. Mm-hmm. But then, oh, this time because I triggered the thing, the door was open, yeah. and so little things like and, that. And I think because um, as I know, we're kind of going back and forth with Zelda and Horizon a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Zelda does actually quite a good job at avoiding that problem mm-hmm. because of the of the way the world is so open, letting you kind of go anywhere after the after you get off the Great Plateau, of course. Um, it's set up That's to... That's the tutorial area at the beginning. Kind of, yeah. And it's okay. it's pretty massive that, even is, for a tutorial Is that a dirty area. word to, to, to use the T word? Uh, it, it kind of is because it implies that they're going to hold your hand and the game really doesn't do that. Gotcha. But it I, it is fair to call it a tutorial a tutorial zone or maybe just call it a beginner zone. But it teaches you the vocabulary of the game. Correct. Okay. But doesn't do so by, by straight up saying... Do this to do that constantly. The like, action words, right? Will, yeah. um, so, but Zelda does that quite well. Where, um, for example, you can get quests to try to figure out how to unlock or, or locate certain secret shrines. Mm-hmm. And uh, for those who don't know, shrines are basically uh, small puzzle dungeons, like mm-hmm. mini puzzle dungeons, where you have to go in. There's one big puzzle theme in this dungeon. In mm-hmm. this dungeon, it's very small. There's oftentimes no enemies. In that, it, sometimes there's there's, a, there's guardians in there, but Oftentimes there's no enemies, and your your goal is just to solve the puzzle, and you know get to the end where the you know old wise sage gives you like a bonus. Mm-hmm. So, in order to find some of these though, you can you can have all of these. You can run into people that will give you clues about where they might be. Um, for example, you can find a traveling um, a Rito, which are the bird people, mm-hmm. playing like an accordion, and he sort of he sings you this song about about it. That was just like a poem mm-hmm. that sort of gives you a hint about where you might go and what you might do to unlock a shrine. Mm-hmm. But if you don't run into that Rito to start that quest, you can still find that shrine. You can still find and unlock that shrine regardless of whether you ha- whether you talk to the Rito, regardless of whether you activated the quest. That's exactly so what I'm talking about. So it lets then. you do it in Zelda. And, and, same, and the same thing with the worlds. If you, if, once you choose to go off the Great Plateau, the world's populated. It's there. 
And so you can do things yeah. in any order. You can go like if you you're not maybe you're not supposed to go to, to I think it's called Lulin Town. L- I found it recently. Lululemon. It's one of the optional places. There's actually a lot of areas it's in the, the world. It's the fish people, right? But Lululemon no. Town. Mm-hmm. No, it's just it's it's just the name of a town. They're oh, actually okay. Highlands there, but it's it's. Interesting because it has places in the in the world that are 100 percent optional. You know what that reminds me of is what you said earlier. Yeah, trust your players. Yes, you got to trust your players to to, to find that content to actually find the, the content yes. on their own. And think of the hours that they put into it. There's also things like optional labyrinths that mm-hmm. you can, that you could find, like literal labyrinths. Not I don't mean that in a in an abstract way. I mean, You're not talking about the temples. You mean I'm, yes, I mean actual labyrinths like that a are maze. giant oh, mazes. That's cool and. You know your reward for getting through them is just another little spirit orb, but mm-hmm. it's but the fun of it is getting through a freaking labyrinth, mm-hmm. right? And and it's not a the tedious hazards. thing you have to do in order to get an achieve. It is no. its own experience. That exactly. Is um, and another example of this, um, I found this quest, and I, I got a huge kick out of this. I later found out online when I talked about it that it was a source of frustration for some people. But there's this island out just out in the middle of the map, way off to the uh, southeast, mm. and of course, my thought when I when I explored and, and, and triggered the tower so that I could see that part of the map, I'm like, I have to go to this island mm-hmm. because there was a rock on that island called Koholit Rock. Now, for anyone that has played Link's Awakening, they know that name. That was the island in Link's Awakening. <laughs> it is my favorite Legend of Zelda game. Yeah. It's, it's also an island. The whole story of that is that Link is in a raft traveling. There's a storm. The raft is basically destroyed. He gets washed up on shore. He has none of his equipment. He has to survive and find a way off the island. Mm -hmm. So I knew that story going into it. I saw that rock. I said, I have to get here. So I I tried all these different... I tried um, jumping. It was really far away. I tried to, like, use... Uh, like fly over with mm-hmm. my, with the wind and everything. I couldn't get it. I, 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 but then I finally found this small island off to the side that was a lot closer with another shrine. And because of the way shrines work and as unlockables, that's an, the game is encouraging you to go to that, go to that shrine because right. it's like why not go to that shrine? It's just going to be like a you know t- five to ten minutes minute puzzle dungeon. I get a reward and I get a, get a warp point. So oh, why wouldn't I do amazing. it? So I go to the shrine. I, I solve it. I come out. There's a korok leaf next to the tree. And there's a raft, which which was there at the first time, too. Of mm-hmm. course, I was just focusing on the shrine. So I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I could use this raft to get to that island. So that's exactly what I do. As I start getting closer to the island, it's the storm strikes. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, they're doing it. So the storm <laughs> strikes. I make it to the island barely. And then there's this moment where, you know, I real, I trigger the shrine, like, guardi- guardian. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're here. We're like something like, we're going to test you to make you have to, like. Oh, I heard about this. Yes, yeah. find the three. Return the three sacred orbs on this island, and then I'll return all of your equipment. And I'm like, uh oh. And then I lost everything. And now I'm like, and the game is very much based on, you know, you get better by getting better um, armor that you find mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and getting better weapons that you find. So, and making food that can heal you and stuff like that. They took away everything. I need my stuff. So basically, aside from my extra heart containers that I had, that I had, I was basically a newbie at this game. And there are some tough enemies in here, including an overruled boss that you have to you have that is wearing one of the orbs around his neck, wow. around his neck, which which he can one shot you. So people were struggling because if you die on this island, and they tell you this: there's no saving on this island. If you die, you are returned to that small island farther mm-hmm, back, mm-hmm. and you have to sail over there again and restart. And it's an experience. Do you get your stuff back, of course. Okay. but but you have to restart that experience, and it's about an about a forty five minute. To an hour experience if you don't know what you're doing or where mm-hmm, to go. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I thought it was a, was brilliant because I had to employ all of these new strategies to figure out how I was going to solve right, this area. Yeah. And one of the ways that I beat uh, it was the Hinox was the giant uh, Cyclopean um, overworld boss. Mm-hmm. And the way that I was able to to, to get his orb, I kind of and, and and I don't want to say I cheesed it because this game encourages you to find creative ways to succeed. Um, so I, I didn't really cheese. I just kind of. I found a clever way to get it. Mm-hmm. So I basically climbed up to a, to a large cliff, the, the, the highest that I could find, paraglided down, landed on his stomach, on his belly. I was very careful so that I would land, like, quietly enough to not, because he's sleeping at the time, mm-hmm. to not wake him up. And then I, like, crept over and picked up the, you know, the orb off of his, like, cut it off of his little necklace. Right, and just right. took it. And of course, that woke him up. And I just hightailed it out of there. And then I then I ran him around to part with like a bunch of trees. So he had to pull, uproot the trees to get to me. It was slowing him down until I ran up a narrow cliff face, and he couldn't follow me anymore. So basically, I just avoided the whole encounter. 
Um, Brilliant. I thought that was the smart way. Yeah. Um, but what I find what I found interesting about that was that that's just one one example of a story that that resonated with me. But it mm-hmm. was something that. But it's your story. My story, and it was one hundred percent optional. I didn't I didn't have to go to this island. In fact, this was in, in a part of the world that you never even have to unlock. Mm-hmm. There is like even if you're if you're following the main quest line. Now, of course, you can skip the Divine Beast entirely and go straight to Ganon. Yeah. But even let's assume that you don't. That you're playing the, the game they want you to play. They want you to go um, defeat all four Divine Beasts before you go to Hyrule Castle. So, yeah. and they also want you to find the Master Sword. Yeah. But I did all of that, and I still found this other area in a complete in a part of the world that has no story, story content in it whatsoever. Like, I chose to go there. Mm-hmm. 100% me. And so I think that's the sort of experience that is really important in an open-world game. And yeah. the developers yeah. have to trust that the player will actually go there because the amount of man-hours and money that they poured into that region, yeah. and it's pretty cool. Like, yeah. that whole region is pretty cool. They had to develop that. They had to design that. And if, if they're thinking, well, our player's only going to do what we tell them to do and go where we tell them to go, well, you've just wasted a ton of money and a ton of time on content that no one will ever see. Yeah. Well, I think we can talk more about how it is that Breath of the Wild does this because I think it's it's pretty brilliant. Some of the things they build into it to get people to want to explore and to like really, um, you know, experience the world in full. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm finding it interesting because I've mentioned before, and I, I said even on our roundtable of Final Fantasy 15, I'm the sort of player that sticks to the main story and only deviates if it's like you know convenient or if I need to grind or something like that. Um, but for the most part, I stick to the main story. Breath of the Wild has been the first time in a very, very long time mm. that I've actually like just meandered. I've just been like freely exploring. Yeah. I, I sort of have like kind of here's my my short term like you know big objective that is going to like you know I'm eventually going to take out this divine beast and that involves steps A, B, C, and D. But like I'll just be wandering around and like you know decide to climb up a cliff and go check out mm-hmm. a shrine and then like oh there's another thing over there and so I'll glide over and the, I'm just going. You, I, I'm really just taking my time yeah. and just kind of exploring freely. When you, Confessions yeah. of an explorer poser. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you hear that beeping, and because the game, it, the game really does pull out the explorer in me too. It really yeah, does. Yeah. When you hear that beeping for your for, to like, sort of like you know, your, your Sheikah slate sort of gives you a hint of you're going in the right direction of a shrine. It's kind of close. When you hear that, and you're going, you're like, okay, I'm going to go to this pass so that I can go to the Goron town to do this one divine beast. Mm-hmm. But that beeping shrine is over in that other direction. Are you really going to pass up that opportunity because you may not find it again? Mm-hmm. So no, you're going to go explore. And by the time you, you you get all the way to that other shrine, it might be up on a cliff. So you've got the shrine, but now wait a minute. I can look around from mm-hmm. this from this tall cliff, and I see another one way over there. Oh, that's totally the opposite direction where I'm supposed to go. Mm-hmm. But am I really going to just not not get this shrine? Come on, I've got to get it. So you jump over, mm-hmm. you go over, and so mm-hmm. it just it it dominoes. Mm-hmm. And I, I had many nights where I would sit there and I would play, um, and. Particularly on the weekends, you know, I might sit and play for not all at the same time. So nobody call, uh, nobody w- be worried that I'm sitting there for like eight hours doing nothing but playing. I, I do. But take, your children, I do take Jim, breaks. yeah, I your wife and children. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I but I will put in like eight hours a day sometimes on a weekend, um, collectively. And my, if my goal is I'm going to take out this divine beast, well, sometimes I'll do. I'll spend all that time playing the game won't actually ever get to the beast mm, because right. I keep finding all these other things. I'm like, oh, this is really cool, especially if I find the new region. And I'm like, well, I have to climb that tower because i got to unlock the map so I can see what else is over there. Yeah, the wonderful distraction. Got to do it. <laughs> got to do it. Right. So, But that's because I want to tell my story. I'm yeah, very interested yeah. in my experience. And while we're talking about exploration, I know we've talked a lot about the player developer story. I do want to talk about gating and how games do it. Mm-hmm. And, and to just sort of – we touched on it a bit and, and quick the way that Zelda does it. Um, it's kind of like the way that Zelda did it in the original Legend of Zelda, and mm-hmm. that's why I want to mention this. Um, you could go basically anywhere in the in the original Zelda, Legend of Zelda right off the bat. Well, as long as you had the right items. No, the on, the only the only items that you ever like the only items that ever helped you go elsewhere. The raft is needed to get you to one of the dungeons, right? And then there is one area where. It's, it saves you a lot of time if you have the ladder, but you can actually still find a way around. That's only two different screens. Everywhere else in the game is accessible from the very start. Really? Yes. I thought, I thought there were bushes you had to burn with the candle and all kinds of things. But you can buy a candle at any point. You don't have to go into a dungeon to oh, get it. Oh, that's true. And so the game act, but the game uses soft gates, and that's what Breath of the Wild does too. Mm-hmm. You're in this one plateau, but then after that you can go anywhere. So the, a soft gate concept is I can go here, but maybe I shouldn't because it's dangerous. 
Mm-hmm. And so, for example, in the original Legend of Zelda, it was you went to a certain region, and there were these weird-looking centaur people called Lynels. Mm-hmm. And they were, they were either blue or red, and they could fling their swords at you. Yeah. And early on, they would kill you pretty quick. Yeah. Well, in this game, uh, as, a, as a nod to the original, because the game does take a lot of cues in terms of design from the original, um, there are Lynels again. And there are certain parts of the world that you go to that it's clear that they're like, hey, uh, hold on a second. Are you sure you want to be here? Because there's just a Lionel roaming around guarding. He's guarding some treasure. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. You want to get that treasure. But you're thinking twice because you know that these guys are tough. And, and the same thing with environmental hazards is another thing they use in Breath of the Wild that they couldn't do in the first Zelda. And that is um, if you go to Death Mountain, you're close to lava. You need to have some sort of equipment to deal with to deal with burn damage. Mm -hmm. You can't use wooden equipment because it'll catch on fire. If you pull out your bomb arrow, and believe me, I tried out of curiosity, I notched a bomb arrow and immediately blew up in my face (laughs) because it's just too hot. There's a, yeah, stupid me, I did it once and I go, did that really happen? Let's do it it again! again. (laughs) Real time's a charm. Right, same thing with with snow. There's snowy regions. If you climb, if you in terms of altitude, if you go too high, it gets colder and colder and colder. Eventually, you will start to take uh, cold free, damage, freeze damage yeah. unless you have equipment or cook yourself food that can temporarily give you, um, you know, help you with st- with you mean the liquor. effects. Uh, there's no liquor in the game, oh, and actually, that's that, that is the odd thing about this game is uh, all the food that's around you, but they're actually. I was just thinking about this. There are no vegetables in the game technically. Oh, that it. doesn't sound healthy at all. Well, there's lots of fruits. Oh, okay. and there's meat. Ooh, and they give things, you the runs. Yeah. There's, there's also cereals and there are herbs. There's yes. There's there's herbs. There's fungus. There are now. There's things like peppers, but that's technically a fruit. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's DLC. The, the vegetable. The vegetable <laughs> DLC. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, no, but but that's the gating that they have in that game, which I think is brilliant because it incur- it gives you a hint of maybe you should be better prepared before you come here, but it doesn't say you can't go there. Right. And if in fact you can still work your way totally through it, yeah. You just have to be a little more clever about it. Okay. So I've got a. A great example for contrast here. Sure. Um, out of Horizon. Uh, this is a little bit spoilery, but not bad. I'll, I'll avoid Uh-oh. the, uh, la, la, the la, plot la. hooks, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll avoid the, 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 the narrative spoilers. Sure. This is a mechanics spoiler. This is, this is my story mm. spoiler, okay? There's a place called the Grave Horde. And if you discover it before you're ready, because mm. it's a story area, the, the door is shut. It's just, it's just closed. There's no way in. Oh. And um, and then whenever the story time comes, I'm like, oh yeah, I've totally been there before. Fast traveled over to it, and guess what? Uh, she she walks up to it and she's like, this door is open. Someone's been here, hmm. right? And so I was like, oh well, okay, uh, that's fine. And and, <laughs> and so I walked. It doesn't in. sound fine to you at all. Doug. Well, I walked in and I did the okay. stuff I was supposed to do. No spoilers there. Um, and I could tell that this area was designed to tell a story. Okay. Um, basically, there was this really cool thing that had happened, call it a thousand years ago, mm-hmm. you know, uh, at, at, the, at the time of the war that causes this whole thing. And you just by looking at this level design, you can piece together the story of what happened. And it's brilliant. It's a brilliant level. Um, it's wonderful. I, I walked off into a pit because it was so... Uh, let's call it authentic. Mm. <laughs> that I'm like, there's no way I'll die if I do that. Whoops. And I just did. And I should have read the clues in the environment better. And I didn't. Um, but, but the visuals tell the story. The problem is there are also audio recordings that tell the story. And they're really, really clustered together to the point where it's like, okay, I'll tag this one and listen to it. Sort of Bioshock style, right? Lots of, lots of stuff. Right. The problem is you have to stop and listen to it before you continue because there's another one. The thing is, there's no meaningful information that actually comes from that that wasn't already obvious from the way they designed that level in the first place. Oh, so they didn't trust the players to pick up. They didn't trust the players. Or or maybe they didn't trust their um, environmental designers. Well, that could be too. I don't know. All I know is that the writing is brilliant. The acting is brilliant. All the pieces are there. It's wonderful. And ultimately, it all comes down to the same problem over and over and over again for me, which I'm going to talk about next week, and it is scale. The scale of the game is all wrong. Mm. It's way too small. That's mm. really what it comes down to for I, me. And I, I mean, I'm hearing trust is a, is a big issue, too, I think trust to is a, I think trust is a and, big and issue. I think, and that's something that I think is a problem with, with open-world games in general, that I think sometimes they're, they're so keen on we want players to see all the cool stuff that we made mm-hmm. that... 
Oh, that's they don't trust true. players to find it. Don't get me wrong, um, Horizon's a beautiful yeah. game, and yeah. and I've played every single day since it came out for at least three hours, and I'm like I said, I'm about sixty hours in, mm. and 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 I and I'm gonna go home tonight. And I'm gonna play it some more, and I'm loving it so much of the game. I'm loving, and I'm loving the story. I'm loving everything. What I don't like is the way the pieces fit together. Mm. That's been frustrating for me. Mm. And so that's a good thing to start um, talking a little bit about. Coming back, you know, sort of full circle to the storytelling in open world games and how these pieces fit together. Because I think that what we have to kind of do is treat these open world games as giant environments in which um, there are like living, breathing elements. There are people, there are cultures, there are towns, there are monsters, all this different stuff. Um, And so you almost have to treat it as if you're just exploring, you know, a world as Mm -hmm. in real life. Um, Trying to find out ways that you can cleverly, um, and you know, some games do a really good job of this. Some do not as good a job of it. Of basically having it be that you sort of just experience the world, and then if there's any sort of story that comes out of it, it is um, either those little tidbits, like you're saying, Doc, of um, you know, finding those recordings, or in Zelda, you can go and uh, find memories, but those are just optional backstory yeah. things. Yeah. Um, and and for me, and I. Or, you know, I, you, you have a quest line yes. where you encounter this character who wants your help with something. Right. And you sort of have an interaction with them, and so it's kind of like a little subplot within mm-hmm. the game. I, I really dislike that element that you were talking about, though. Because a lot of games have done that where they have the little, oh, here's a little audio clip. We're going we're gonna to give you some exposition. It's frustrating because I feel like your game world should be able to stand on its own two feet without that information. The player should be able to, to infer that information from the way that the level is built, which apparently it sounds like you can, yeah. yet they still give you the and recordings. And they still add it on. Why? I think, honestly, it comes down to one thing. They looked at a dozen or a half a dozen video games they wanted to emulate, and they took all the things from those games they liked, and they put them all in. There's stuff from Assassin's Creed in there. There's stuff from, honestly, there, 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 there's, there's stuff from Enslaved uh, Odyssey to the West. There really, really is, all the way down to the jumping. You, you can't just climb a mountain. You have to climb on the waypoint. So if, if you feel like, I want to go to that mountain, um, you, you're going to have to solve the puzzle of how to get to the top of the mountain by finding the handholds. Whereas in Assassin's Creed, you want to jump to a thing, you're going to jump to a thing and you're going to be there. With, uh, with Zelda, Breath of the Wild, you want to climb a thing, you climb it. You just yeah. better not run out of stamina. Right. <laughs> you know, and so it's a completely different philosophy. And, and the philosophy of finding the handhold... That's platformer, mm-hmm. and so there's very ele- much so, there's yeah. elements of Horizon that are platformer, and that was deeply disappointing because to me. it's because it's it's not arguably that goes against I, I do think it does it goes against the open world it goes against the very philosophy yeah. of an open world because it's not open if you have to find these little points. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm kind of reminded actually mm-hmm. of we've talked a little bit before about A, B, and C story arcs. Um, and the way that you yes. sort of experience these. And I think that I, I'm just going to use Zelda as an example because I think it works very well. You've got the A story arc of Link re- reawakens after some calamity happened 100 years ago mm-hmm. and needs to go defeat Ganon. That right there is a complete story. And granted, it's probably like the, the lightest story, if you will. Like there's not a ton to it as far as what we would think of storytelling and, and games as being like, you know, dialogue and cutscenes and stuff like that. But you do have a player story that is wake up, Go kill Ganon. And, and the cool thing about, about that, too, with that player story, is that you get to choose I mean, and, and it does, how much you want to, how much Link wants to remember before he goes and kills Ganon. Yeah, and exa- that's exactly yeah. my point, is that your B and C story arcs, say we'll call the B story arcs, each time you go kill a divine beast, there's kind of like a little bit of a quest line in order to do mm-hmm. that. Or and you get part of your easier. memory back, too, in the process. Exactly. Um, and so that's yeah. kind of your B Just story like arcs. Just like Shadow of the Colossus. But yeah. those are optional. And then you no, have like your C story arcs, <laughs> which could be like all the other miscellaneous side quests, all the little encounters, um, you know, say getting back your memories, like all the, all the extra like non-mainline quest stuff. Um, which, if this was a TV show or a very linear, um, mm-hmm. very linear game, very linear story, we'd be having these arcs, and we'd kind of just be layering them over each other. Whereas here, the player is getting to choose which arcs they explore, or they are just even if they're not thinking of choosing which arcs they explore, they're just mm-hmm. encountering these and, arcs. As and they isn't play that the game. what isn't that what makes a game open world? Because I would say, as an open world game, it's not so much about, and this is, it's not so much about. I have this big world. That I can explore, it's it, which is a part of it. But I'm saying that the overall philosophy is, I can do what I want in this world. Mm-hmm. I do not have to like like a, a game that is not open world is something like you know Super Mario Brothers, where I'm talking about the original yeah, level levels. level one one. Then you go yeah. level one two. You can skip and do different levels, 
mm-hmm. but it's not open. And so I think when you have a game like, uh, just to kind of you know wrap up some of our talk here, you have a game like, um, whether it's Horizon or, or Zelda Breath of the Wild, um, these ga- the, the, the designers need to recognize what, what they want to do in terms of like the openness and mm-hmm. how much freedom they want to give the players. And if you're going to have an open world game, you should go all in with it. Yeah. And, I, and I do wonder, because I, I think we kind of stumbled on a pretty good point there when it comes to, to trusting your player base and trusting your players to find this content and to want to find the content. You have to trust your own, your own sense of design and your you know, coworkers that they've created a world that is interesting enough that the players will want to find all of the little tidbits of tiny mm-hmm. hidden information mm-hmm. that you have put out there. You want them to do that. And if you feel like that they can't do that or that you haven't created a world that is interesting enough that they will want to do that, yep. you failed. Yeah. That's my opinion. That, but I don't know it's maybe a harsh opinion, but I think you failed you know, there to are, make an, a good open world there, game. There are Skyrim mods that actually take out the main plot. They just remove the main plot entirely. Yeah. And, and for certain... Players, that's a much stronger, richer game because you're creating your own. You don't have to do the whole "I'm um, Dragonborn" plot. But mm-hmm. you know, to, not to, not to not to rag too hard on Horizon. Um, one of the things that really drew me in from the previews and, and all of that was um, you're going to be just going along and you're going to find this hole and you're going to be like, it's a cave, and you go into the cave. All the stuff you're talking about here with, with Zelda. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to go in and you're going to discover, oh my goodness, there's a thing in here, and I have to get other stuff and unlock it. Well, once I got to that point, what I realized was as I was walking along on my mini map, bing, it popped up. So it wasn't actually the discovery process at all. Everything's actually on your any on your mini map. Um, so if if you're really looking for that experience of discovery, um, there are guys who sell maps to to the items. Don't buy them. Don't buy them. Just just don't buy the maps. Mm-hmm. Um, go find them yourself. And I think it would be a lot richer of an exploratory experience. So I think that the part of the problem that the developers were having was they were like, okay, obviously we want to do this thing here. But just in case, yeah. we want to also make sure to include a thing so that they can also do it this way. Because what if they and don't just find in it? case, yeah. we want to also do it. And so the, the redundancy, the quadruple redundancy for everything means that there's not even just one guy who sells mm-hmm. those maps. There's like four people who sell those maps. Yeah. And not only that, but you can buy them multiple times even though you already have them. And it does nothing for you. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, why not then make it so you have to hunt down all four map sellers so you can have all – you know, they only have parts of the map. Mm-hmm. They, and, and that would be that cool. That makes more sense. That would be cool. Yeah. Then the hunt becomes about finding the map. No, all four of them sell complete maps of a thing which is a unique item in the game that someone took the time to go map. Look, it's – a vessel, a mysterious vessel. I shall mark this on my map and then go sell it to a merchant and not take the vessel <laughs> that that merchant wants. You know what I'm saying? There's a disconnect there. Um, so I think I think it yeah. suffers from knowing it's a video game a little too much. And that leads back into the main topic at hand, which is that when you're storytelling in an open world, you, you, are you going to design your world around the story, or are you going to design your story in that world? You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a right. big right. difference. And that's – yeah, exactly. Like we said, I mean you, you establish the rules of the world, make sure they're consistent, give, give player the tools that they need to seek out those parts of the world, mm-hmm. to explore the world, and your job's practically done. Mm-hmm. I mean if you, if you can get that part right, you've made a good you've – ar- you've already practically made a good game. Sure, you've got to figure out that little pesky part of you know, how's the player going to control, you know, what, like for example, combat is mm-hmm. a whole system obviously but it, it, for games that have combat. But you're almost there. You've almost – you almost have made a good game just off, right off the bat if you can get those rules right. That's right. Because everything else kind of falls into place. That's you know? right. If, you also if have the rules to, work, you also the player have to, has to abide by those rules and, too. And you have to nail the player motivation. Yes. And oh, what's, yeah. What's interesting oh, yeah. is like you know, we can sort of compare a lot of the things like, well, this game and this game kind of do it the same way. But then when you think about – what doing that thing means in the context of those respective games. Yeah. Zelda is kind of like intrinsically motivating. It sounds to me like Horizon is a little bit more extrinsically motivating. Yeah, it really is. That's and a good way to put like it. They're trying to give you the you're like here's yeah. why you should want to do this. Mm-hmm. Is that what, the way you Actually, feel? yeah, and they guarded yeah. the secrets really heavily. Like for example, uh, some of the boards are talking about whether or not the location 
is a spoiler. And so we're going to spoil that next next episode. Um, and yeah, don't actually, shut us off. It'll be fine. actually reveal what the location for Horizon Zero Dawn is. So if you want to know what that is, then play an hour. Mm-hmm. But uh, but that's the point. Is as others are like the locate. Why would the location be a spoiler? That's silly. It's I mean it's a location. Anybody can look at the trailers and figure it out. Some people already had before the game released. It's and, Jurassic Park. Come on, they it, find the camp. It, you know, exactly. all the dinosaurs have been <laughs> transformed. They're, weird. They're actually like. Uh, um, dino Zords, you know, they've got like armor pieces on Jurassic them. Jurassic Park was all along just animatronics. Yeah. And it's just that the flesh is melting. The flesh is There we off. go. Yeah, that's yeah. totally what it was. <laughs> um, anyway. Damn you, Hannon. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, th- I don't know. That, that falls into the category of, of stuff I didn't expect to bug me that did. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where y- you seem to be handed this amazing, wonderful world. And it's like, go discover our world in the way we tell you to. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Sense of discovery is important. Player story, I think, is the biggest, most important part. And you need to trust your player mm-hmm. to, to seek out and want to have their own experiences and want to have their own story and want to just... Dis- to discover it. Mm -hmm. For me, it comes down to an example. Um, Early in the game, one of the things in Horizon that you're doing uh, is preparing to prove yourself at something called The Proving. And so in The Proving, there's a sequence that I knew was coming. Mm. I was going to have to win. I was going to have to beat the other members, the young members of the tribe, because I've been training my whole life to do this. Aloy's been training. And I knew it was coming. I knew this Ludo narrative moment was coming where I was either going to have to reload uh, the save because I failed or else it was going to do a cut scene and I wasn't going to be the one who was actually doing it. Their Ludo narrative solution to that I think was brilliant. It was brilliant what they chose to do because I still had to do it and yet I still couldn't lose if that makes any sense. And it didn't seem fake. Um, it actually seemed really clever. Until Will Parsons who has this <laughs> track history of, of just ruining everything for me yes, because um, he's awesome. <laughs> Uh, he said to me, yeah, the problem is that the outcome of that race didn't actually matter because, and then he gave me the reasons why it didn't matter, and he was dead right, mm. absolutely dead right. And in that moment, what I realized is they could have just straight up given you the actual race, maybe you failed, maybe you didn't, and in that moment, you'd be like, dude, are they really going to let me s- just have sucked at that? Why, have, why am I not reloading? Oh, my goodness. Or, yeah, I totally did it. I did it on my own. I did it the first try. Woo! Mm-hmm. Because of what happens next. And because of what happens next, the actual outcome didn't, matter. Outcome didn't, didn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and you still are able to move forward in the plot, and, and it makes sense. Mm-hmm. This is the problem that I have. Let it be natural. Let it be organic. Let it actually make sense in your world. Let the player um, actually, you know... F- fail or succeed on their own without a reload, mind you, and actually figure out narrative solutions to, to problems that that work. You know what I'm saying? And figure out mechanical solutions to the narrative problems that work, both in your world and with the story you're telling. That's where I am with it. Um, so that whenever Chris comes to it, and so did you beat the did, did you beat the proving? No, I didn't beat the proving. What happened? Mm-hmm. And you have those you know those right. water cooler moments mm-hmm. where you're like, well, this is the way it happened for me. Mm-hmm. Did you get to that one That's island where the thing? What happened? is your story? And, exactly. And Zelda's that full of those. And yeah. <laughs> I, I can imagine we're going to be talking about Zelda for a decade. Mm-hmm. We, we just start and 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 to just just throw out there an old game that I love, Minecraft. Right. That's one of the reasons Minecraft was so successful for a generation for like a decade is because it was, okay, I did this thing in Minecraft and nobody else has done this thing that I did. And it was, it was all about your story because there was no story. Mm. And when they finally got to the point where they were shoving in like cre- end credits and go beat the dragon and just that kind of stuff is when it started to fade and it started becoming, quote unquote, a kid's game. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 95 of the backward compatiblecom podcast, our discussion on uh, player and developer narratives in open-world games. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm post-apocalypse doc. Or post-doc, for short. I'm post-doc. That's it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast.
Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.